Um, so welcome. Um, so I will now, um, this is the last talk in this particular session and is given by Jesus Perez Rios. Uh, Jesus did his um, PhD from University of Madrid, uh, you, uh, rather University da Compulsense de Madrid. He's fine, I'm sorry, he's fine. I, I, I'm sorry if I messed up the pronunciation. Hey. That's um, okay. But um, yeah, just my Indian tongue cannot wrap itself around uh, the, uh, some of these pronunciations. Anyway, sure. beyond that, he he went to Ecole Normale Superior, where he did a postdoc. And after that, he was in Purdue with uh, Professor Chris Green and um, Professor Francis Robichaud. And uh, beyond, I mean, after that, he actually took up a position at the Univers Universidad del T Turabo, following which he is now at the Fritz Haber you know, uh, Institute, uh, where he has his own program and team, and he's running a whole bunch of uh, theory calculations, supporting experiments. Okay, over to you, Jesus. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Also, I noticed that as we are moving through the meeting, the number of participants is getting down. All right, it's funny <laughs> when you are the last. So then I will try to make it shorter and nicer also because it's getting late for you guys and it's Friday afternoon, right? So you should go and party. Well, that's not <laughs> good now, right? But anyway, so my talk here, it's I'm the only theoretician of, of today, so it's kind of good and also uh, interesting. So my idea is just to present a particular perspective about cold chemistry maybe a little bit different. And of course, I would like to, to start saying thanks to, to the team. Of course, without them, everything will be much more harder. So Shangeli is a PhD student, Marjan Miramadi is a postdoc, and Miruna Kretu is a, is a, is a summer student. Here's the website of our, play, of our group if you are interested in it. So what we're going to talk. So I know that the, the point of this meeting or this is try to educate, right, to give, so give like an overview. And this is what I'm going to try to do. So what is fuel physics? So I'm pretty sure that if you think about fuel physics, you will think about the FMOF, right? And all these kind of universality, which is kind of true. If you think about the cold chemistry, you will have all these things like the talks that we have seen by Johannes and also René, like all these kind of wonderful reactions and things like that, right? And then there's a third part, which also kind of was covered uh, by the first talk by Matthias about impurity physics, but of course in a different manner and looking at different perspective. So I believe that all these three things are part of the same physics. And that's what I want to, to explain today. So let's start. First of all, what is field body physics? Well, <laughs> the definition is, is kind of trivial, right? It's part of physics that deals with field body degrees of freedom. And indeed it's interesting, this is a, a research that I did, like if you go to the APS, the APS has a, a topical group meeting uh, uh, called Few Body Physics. And, and it's interesting that you read what is the group for, right? Which kind of what kind of people are part of it? They said that we are an umbrella organization of atomic, molecular, nuclear, particle, and mathematical physicists, as well as quantum chemists who are interested in the, the dynamics of simple systems. Also, you can read that Systems that have few degrees of freedom are kind of uh, classified as a few body physics. So at the end of the day, what you can say is like any chemical reaction is basically a few body process. And indeed, if you're interested, you can publish papers in these uh, kind of journals uh, if you're doing chemistry, because as I said, it's a chemical reaction. And that's the, the, the point I want to make today. So the other part of the talk basically is what is about cold chemistry, but this has been also pretty well introduced by Johannes in the second talk today. Basically the definition is like, well, it's an chemical reaction between one Kelvin and one millikelvin. Below one millikelvin, people call about ultra cold, okay? And this is something related with uh, what René was saying about getting the, uh, going to this wave limit. He, this is a wonderful review by Roman Krenz that, is, that really states what are the benefits of doing cold chemistry. One of the things is like you are going to be sensitive to quantum effects like resonance, and then you can control reactions and things like that. But the most important thing is like you can play with external fields. At these very low temperatures, what happens is the interaction of your system, atoms or molecules with your external fields are kind of the same order of magnitude as the kinetic energy. So then playing with external magnetic electric fields, 
you can kind of uh, make the system do whatever you you like. So basically, the the system is is dancing to the music that you're playing, which is pretty nice. One particular example about what is uh, called chemistry example is this kind of uh, wonderful work by the Narvisus uh, group at Weizmann. So the idea here is to observe um, they are sensitive to this shape resonance or orbiting resonance, where basically what happens is like the incoming particle can tunnel through a barrier, and then you can see that resonance on the cross-section. This is a very interesting um, topic. And also you can, of course, sorry, I have to make advertise on my own book, otherwise uh, it's kind of weird, right? So I have written a book about an introduction of color and tropical chemistry, where basically I cover atoms, ions, molecules, and rivers, kind of a general perspective of the field. So now let's go to the topic. So I'm going to talk only about two things. I will try to be sure, I promise, okay? It's late, I know. So one is going to talk about single ion in a bath, in a tropical bath, which is related with the talk of Johannes and the talk of René. And the second part is one the bath molecules. So I'm going to show you that basically the theory behind this part is also related with this one, which is pretty impressive. So let's start with a single ion in an ultra cold bath. So one way to look at that is like um, what most people believe is like you have your ion in your bath and then you can look at this as a kind of an impurity problem, right? So basically you can use all these many body approaches which are pretty impressive. And then you can study all these kind of uh, coherences, quasi-particles and all that business. However, I'm a physicist. So for me, this is then transformed into this. It's like the ion can react with the atoms of the bath and can form a new, a new guy. This new guy is a molecular ion. And this is through three body recombination that Johan explained in his talk. However, what is funny is like when an ion collides with two neutrals, can happen two things, right? So you can have a molecular ion plus a neutral, or you can have a neutral molecule plus an ion. So now the question is, which one is the most important one? Well, also it's important to mention that this process, three body combination, is only efficient when you have a high density because you know you need a lot of these guys and that guy to be able to find in the same spot and collide, right? So you do this experiment, uh, these uh, kind of experiments are very low density, this guy will not matter. In order to treat three body recombination, the first thing that uh, someone has to deal with or has to think about it is about whether we can use a classical treatment or we need a full quantum treatment. The reason why is simple. A quantum treatment for three body problems is quite complicated. I mean, it's like not complicated to develop or code, it's complicated in terms of computational time. It is a very demanding program. So then what, uh, what I have been doing or what we do in our group, basically, is like think a, a little bit, just stop and think. And the way how we do it is basically, it's pretty simple. It's like, if we want to analyze any kind of collisional problem, all the, so this guy will have some kind of low range interaction, like one over R to the N, right? In the case of atom ion, one over R to the fourth, that Johannes is playing his talk. So for a given collision energy, basically it's very easy to estimate how many partial waves of this L here, the, the centrifugal term, you need for your collision, right? In order to convert to the cross section. And then this is the result when you solve this. So basically you need to find what is the maximum and see uh, when the maximum is equal to the collision energy. And then you see which L is that. And this is the expression, okay? So then basically you plug here a collision energy and will give you how many Ls do you need. So you can also use this expression the other way around. You can say, okay, let's assume that with, let's say 20 partial waves, it's going to be for me pretty hard to see different resonance because I will have so many of these barriers. I will have so many of these orbiting resonance that I mentioned before in Narvisus results that it's going to be hard to identify them. And basically all the quantum effects will be washed out. And if, if we assume that 20 is kind of the threshold, right? Between quantum mechanics matter or the system is so messy that we cannot really identify resonance. This is what happened. So here in blue, I have kind of um, the lower, uh, so the, the, lower the lower limit where this approximation works. So basically where classical mechanics should work. And of course, as you see most of these neutral alkali, they are, you know, of course, you need to do quantum mechanics. Sure. However, and the moment that you charge one of them, the guy goes really down. And indeed you see that all alkali, alkali plus collisions are within the cold chemistry regime. I mean, below one Kelvin and one millikelvin between this range. 
they all can be treated classically. So in principle, when we try to look at the experiments of uh, Johannes principle, it is, we can show that there are so many partial waves contributing that the problem, there is no point in doing quantum mechanical because it, uh, 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 it's hard and also is not useful maybe because we are going to have the same physics here. Say that, then what we did is to develop a method, okay? And our method is kind of funny. I would like to explain because it's a, some people don't like it, but okay, I like it. So the idea is a very mathematical idea. So the idea is a mapping problem. So when you have uh, n particles in a three-dimensional space, like in our world, of course, I'm not counting uh, the time as the fourth dimension, okay? This is non relativistic business. I have to be specific. So then in principle, you can map this problem it's just a mathematical transformation, of course, into a single particle problem in a 3n minus 3d space. This is just a mathematical transformation. And now you can say, okay, why do you want to complicate your life too much, right? Yeah, I asked that myself the first time, but then I realized why it's worth it. And it's the reason why. For a three-body recombination, basically, if we neglect the center of mass motion, we have six degrees of freedom. So of course, you can try to deal, to treat this problem with two impact parameters in 3D and then spend all your time seeing where are the angles, something like that, and then you get crazy. However, there's something more interesting. If you go to a six dimensional space, you can map out your row one, row two, which are the Jacobi vectors into a six dimensional vector. So then you choose your initial conditions in six dimensional space. You go to 3D, use of, Newton's equation, Hamilton equations in the 3D space, as you usually do, and then you transform back into the three-dimensional space. And the reason why is because in that case, the cross-section is so simple as this. So basically, the cross-section in a three-dimensional space looks pretty similar to a typical two-body cross-section in 3D, where here we have this guy, sigma b5, it's just the angular element. So in principle, we, we should have here a two pi, right? And here, usually we have a BDB because we're in a 3D, but here we have B4DB just because we are in a higher dimensional space. However, this function P is just the opacity. So basically it's just the probability that the event is happening for a given impact parameter and collision energy. And this is kind of, at least personally, I feel like very clean theory and easy to apply. This is an example about how it looks like, right? Different kind of trajectories, because at the end, what we are doing all day long is just calculating trajectories and looking how many of these trajectories end up in a molecular formation or not. That's it. And these are different examples for, for different systems at the same collision energy. But also what is nice is like, for instance, here is like some opacity functions, like what I mentioned before, like the probability as a function of the input parameter for different collision energies, 10, 50, and 100 millikelvin. And in this case, I'm choosing barium plus ruby and ruby. And as you can see here, and what you expect, of course, the lower the collision energy, the larger the impact parameter is. As you expect, just because the lower the collision energy, you are more sensitive to the long range of your interaction. And this is uh, what you can see here. And this is just a way to, to, to show you what we need. So at the end of the day, in order to get the cross sections, once you know what is the probability, you just integrate that with the factor I showed you before, and that is the result, pretty simple. Here is some of the results uh, that uh, Johannes uh, mentioned something about it. So this is one paper that we had with, uh, with his group. And basically what they, what they observed there is like in principle. So indeed what, what, we, what we can say is like we can, I mean, I, I was impressed. Like our results can really explain the experimental data. Okay. And that's pretty nice. And in order to be able to really understand and agree with the K3, something that we had to realize, which it was kind of a little bit a little bit hard. It's like, it's important to know what is the energy distribution of the ion. And as you guys know, the energy distribution of the ion in a pole trap is non maxwell bottom. So then you have to do the color simulation to get the, uh, uh, the energy distribution and then convert that energy distribution with the energy dependent rate to get the thermal average. But of course, that depends on the macro motion for sure. And then in that case, we have this blue line. This blue line is the result of our theoretical calculations, fully ab initio. I mean, no fitting parameter. I mean, we're just using a model potential, which the only thing that you need is the long range, which is just the experimental long range. 
But the red line is the experimental fitting. And as you see, the trend is pretty similar. It's a small shift. So we are pretty happy with this result. And of course, something that's interesting, like if you're interested in the impurity physics, like I don't know what happened with, the, with your polaron, what is the lifetime of the polaron, something like that. If you have like a normal rate of 10 to the minus 24 centimeters, um, centimeters to the six divided by second, and you have a density 10 to the 14, I believe, or 10 to the 13 it was. The lifetime is like 10, uh, you have 10 um, millisecond minus one, the rate. So that basically puts some constraints on your lifetime of your impurity. Once the purity, if you know, if you know, if and only if the impurity is charged, okay, yeah, like this, better, right? Much better. So, sorry again, and thank you for your understanding and for your patience. So, what, what I wanted to say is like the reason why it's interesting to know how three body recombination occurs is like basically it's kind of the very beginning of a bunch of very complex chemical reactions that Johan explained from further dissociation to spin change reactions so a lot of things uh, that it's going on on here and that's the interesting part here however since johannes already did that i'm not going to talk about that but what is interesting as what i was saying before it, like we found like since the one over r to the four potential is much more stronger than one over r to the six it's possible to show that the cross section basically is dominated by the long range interaction between the atom and the ion and basically the, the atom atom interaction is just kind of an expectator. And we can prove that the cross section scales with energy in this way. Of course, these are theoretical results, okay? This is not experimental results. I have to say that the, the points with error of bars is just because we are doing a Monte Carlo, okay? So then, what is nice is like we can see applying that theory, that threshold, we can even explain results that people didn't could explain until now at different, at different temperatures for different uh, novel gases. So usually people in the 80s, they did a lot of ion mobility of different like helium plus in helium, uh, krypton in krypton and things like that. And in green here, you see our results, which agree kind of pretty well with the rental ones. So then basically what it means is like when an ion interacts with two atoms at the end, what you have is molecular ions most of the time. So basically the other channel is highly suppressed. And also that means that, that we can prove or we have some confidence that the cross section should go like the recollection energy in this way. This is, this is of course a classical circle law. At some point when you are getting really, really cold, this should break, okay? Because that, that, that doesn't have any, any quantum behavior on it. Also, what you can do is uh, something that also um, the next plane is what we have been interested in but uh, it's what happened when you change kind of uh, the background or, or the bath to the ion. So we have the same initial state, an ion surrounded by something. But that something now is listening to molecules. And the good thing is like in the experiment of Rene, since they have felt that molecules basically changing the magnetic field, they can change the binding energy of the molecule. And then we have a new way to, or let's say a new free parameter to explore in order to understand what is the chemistry behind. And what turns out is like, it can happen three things. So basically as more as Rene explained, the ion just can have a reaction where you have a molecular ion, you can break the molecule or you can quench the molecule, right? That's, that's all the things that can happen. So then how we do that? So basically what we did here is a quasi-classical trajectory calculations. This quasi-classical only means like the initial state of a molecule is chosen in a way that agrees with the bohr sommerfeld quantization rule for the potential that you have. So the only ingredients is having the potentials and something good that we did here, thanks to Henrik, which is the a PhD student of Rene, like we were able to include not only the secular approximation for the potential of the ion, but also we include especially the time dependence on the atom, uh, sorry, on the ion which is pretty nice because usually when you do what I showed you before about three body combination, we did not include the effects of the trap. So basically we are doing a free field case. However, the good thing of having the time here is we can also see what are the effects of the trap onto the product. So one of the things that you can think is, well, if you have a weakly bound molecular ion, maybe the electric fields of the trap can tear the, the guy apart, right? Can happen. 
So in our theory, this is what we can study. And as I say here, this is just to show you the kind of expression. This is how we can control the final state distribution, just in case we're interested in, of uh, the um, lithium-2 or the molecular ion, whatever we are looking at. And this is the WKD approximation, as I mentioned, within the QCT approach. And, and at the end of the day, what we can have after studying what, what are the two kind of main reactions is what we call kind of a phase diagram of the charge impurity. So in principle, you start with a charge impurity in a molecular bus. However, under certain conditions, this guy can tune to a different impurity. You can end up with a molecular ion in a molecular bus. And you can see here that playing with the matrix field and the, and the collision energy, you can choose where you can end up. So basically we are studying the tunability of our system and also to see how sensitive is the, how to say, when you have a single impurity, how strict is that? Because at some point this guy can, can react. And this is what we have in this, in, in this plot. So now we go to the final part of the talk and it's about the Van der Waals molecule. I like this figure a lot about the small Ico climbing because it's impressive. And by the way, this is for Van der Waals interactions as you know, guys know. I like a lot this um, sentence about what is a Van der Waals molecule. I like to introduce a little bit this here because I know that at least during this part of the odd meeting, we have been listening a lot about atom, ions, and feedbacks. And one of the molecules is something more like, uh, I would say, more chemistry oriented. Okay. So these are the, the, one of the definitions of one of the molecules. One of the molecules are weakly bound complexes or small atoms or small atoms or molecules held together, not by chemical bonds, but by intermolecular attractions. So basically, uh, molecular, uh, the one of the molecules is. Indeed, the underbars is a new binding and is a new binding mechanism. So indeed, the binding energy of these things are pretty small, like 10 with numbers. And what's interesting is that like when you have the two guys in the long range, the binding energy it's due to the long range interaction, van der Waals interaction that we have seen in previous talks. However, when the guys are getting closer, the electron, the electronic clouds between the two atoms stand, you know, to repel each other and to interact. And that gives rise to the short range. So at the end of the day, a van der Waals molecule is just, how to say, another normal molecule, but usually the minimum of the potential, the given distance is pretty long range. So you see between six bore and maybe 12 bore. So that's the difference. So compared with the typical covalent ones, which is like um, three bore, it's kind of pretty far away. And also the binding energy is pretty different. We are talking about one mil electron volt, even less. Well, that the typical binding energy for a covalent is one EV. So, so some examples of one valve molecules is zinc. I think it's a very nice thing because it's a closed shell, right? So any closed shell with a closed shell, it will give you kind of a van der Waals. But the one that we're interested in here is rare gas with any atom. What I mean by any atom is like, you have like helium with lithium, helium with titanium, helium with anything will end up in a van der Waals molecule. And what we are going to do is to try to understand how that happened. But before that, I would like to show you one of the most important uh, van der Waals molecules, helium-2. This is a, a world famous uh, molecule. And the reason why it's so famous is because it was hard to show that it really exists. It took several years. Uh, I mean, from the experiments, of course, that's what I mean. And the potential is kind of very weakly bound. And what is interesting, like it only has one bound state. But this bound state has the property that they call a halo state. So basically the wave function is super elongated. And then it has a really interesting quantum nature. As you can see, it can be as, as large as a DNA, which is pretty impressive. And this is one of the relations or one of the inter interest on van der Waals molecules, because these things, since they're weakly bound, may have a lot of intriguing quantum behavior. So how we do this? Again, we apply through word recombination. And this is just a scheme of the different coordinates. The row one, row two is the one, the Jacobi coordinates that I talked to you before. And here, basically, what we have is an orange is the normal, is the helium atoms in this case. And the blue is any kind of atom. We have, we have tried some alkali, we, we are going to show some titanium results, something like that. And this is what uh, can happen in three different um, trajectories. So some of them go to what they call an elastic collision. So basically, Three particles come in, three particles go out, nothing happens. Then of course we can have molecule formation. And of course, 
what happened is like the kind of molecule that you form, the binding energy that it has, it changed. And it depends from iteration to iteration. And this is what we look at. The most interesting thing is like we have been, we decided to look at a bunch of them. Uh, we look at six different systems. So we look at helium with lithium, titanium, arsenide, phosphorus, nitrogen, and sodium. And what we notice, like, in, as you can see, the potentials are pretty different, right? So in principle, we will expect like a totally different massive results, like nothing can be, that, can be said about it. However, we saw that all the results behave the same. What it means, like, there's always like kind of um, uh, power law here, and then there's some kind of uh, change of behavior and another power law for all of them. However, at the point that that happens, change. And we realized that the point where this thing change is the dissociation energy of the X helium interaction. It is expected to be dissociation energy and not binding energy, just because in classical mechanics as we are doing, we don't have zero point energy. So then the interesting magnitude is dissociation energy instead of binding energy. But it's something that uh, it, was, it, it was very, interesting to us to see like we have these two different behaviors and then we will also realize it's like this part over here correlates basically with the long range tail of the interaction however this part over here correlates with the short range of the potentials as i'm going to show you in a, in a different slide but the most interesting result was this one it's like when you calculate the thermal um, average free body conversion rate for any of the atoms with helium, the order of magnitude is the same. So it's interesting that some of them has been observed like titanium. So what we think is like, if you can see titanium, basically you can see everything, but by the way, sorry, no, has been observed lithium and titanium. So then basically the message is like almost everything that you put in a buffer gas cell, which is kind of the re relevant temperature here. So let's say that you ablate aluminum in helium, you will have aluminum helium. If you ablate, I don't know, anything that you ablate there or anything that you put there, you are going to have a one of those molecules through three-body recombination. And that's what, uh, what really strikes us because we didn't expect that. And as I mentioned before, here we have the final, how to say, explanation about what is short range, what is long range. Here in the top panel, we have the results for when, this is for helium, helium, titanium, three-body recombination to form titanium helium. We have here two different potentials. The blue one is when we are using a full ab initio interaction potential for titanium helium. But the red one is when we are using this Buckingham potential. So basically it's a potential where you have the same, uh, mini, uh, the same equilibrium distance, but a different well depth. And as you can see, this part over here is the same, doesn't change because the normal range is the same as we expected. But then the position where the, the behavior change into a different power law depends on the dissociation energy as we already um, expected. And of course, since the short range is different, we see a different power law or a different behavior here. However, in the lower and lower panel, what we are doing is we are taking a potential that is exactly the, has the same, has different equilibrium distance, but the same depth. And then what we see is like, they, they, the change between the two trends happen at the same point. And they are pretty similar. So basically it's like, unless your depth is different, you're going to see a change here. And basically what it means is like this behavior is quasi-universal. What I mean quasi-universal, like of course, the, the, there's a shift here that depends on the system, but the trend with the temperature here and there seems to be general to all kind of uh, X helium systems. And just to finalize, as I, as I try to be, um, fast is like, I hope to convince you that few of the processes play a role in impurity physics. What I mean is like, if you want to understand a many body character of a system, sometimes it's good to look at the few body physics first. Not because they are different, no, no. It's just because we need help from, from each other. Then, then uh, a single ion involves into a molecular ion and atomic molecular gas, as we have seen, and then Van der molecules emerge as a consequence of triple recombination, which is something that people didn't figure out until now. Hopefully they are convinced. And the last point is like, it seems like anything that you put in a buffer gas source, we can end up in a Van der molecule formation. 
I would like to say thank you guys for this opportunity to organize it, especially to Suraf Duda, and also the uh, Radon University, which I'm part of. And you're interested to learn more uh, questions, just yeah, you can ask me directly or go to the website or whatever. Feel free. Thank you. So thank you very much. Uh, we have time for questions. Uh, so the chat is not yet uh, active. So maybe I will start with a question of my own. Um, so the thing is that you you did mention in one of your um, in one of the sections is that um, for an ant trap now you are actually looking at the the very the time varying trap potential in order to compute the effect on the trap tires and the collisions. The thing is that um, what if the the trap the highest frequency in a trap is at the level of megahertz. And uh, if you just look at the collisional times for these uh, these um, you know charge neutral kind of uh, collisions, they are typically still short. So, hmm. how much difference is this actually expected to make? Ah, the difference is not in the collision; it's in the products. Ah, you you're saying that the 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 branching ratio into the product channel is going to change. So what I mean is like here, that's something that indeed one referee ask. Okay, that is why we are looking at. I was not a referee. No, no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that you were the referee. I'm saying that if it's one of these things that a referee asks something and you start to think and say, oh, it's right. And maybe we should look it up, right? So this is what, 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 that's what I was saying. So basically the point is like, we can go here or like here, right? right. So you have a collision. Here, you, what you say is totally true, right? The trap here doesn't care about the collision. The problem is when you have this guy over here, in McLaren, what happened to it? Is now uh, how this guy reacts with the presence of the trap. So in principle, you will say like, but I need a calculation that show that's not true, but it doesn't matter. So you can think like if this is a binding energy of this guy is like, let's say 100 micro Kelvin. It's going to be for you very easy to break it, right? Yeah. In principle, you will see yeah. that. And that's what we were impressed in these simulations. When we grew the dime, we didn't see that that thing happened. So these guys survived on the trap. Of course, classically, okay? This is a classical simulation. How to, that's what I mean by dependence of the trap, not on the initial step. Of course, the initial step, we don't care. But the problem is on the product, how the products get affected. and. Yeah, that's the thing, something that we are still trying to figure out from the full quantum treatment. Oh, okay. So, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, welcome. Any further questions? Is a CBD threshold law that you have shown, is this universal? Does it apply to any CBD systems? Yeah, in principle, I would say yes, but of course, I didn't try with all. <laughs> so I have tried with all these. So basically, the idea is as long as your energy, your collision energy is smaller than the dissociation energy of your system, this should be true. Okay. So the thing is, if you try this with neutrals, of course, you're not going to work because uh, this, this already will break up some of these bundle bus molecules. So this only works pretty well for ion because as you know, uh, and helium plus helium interaction is way stronger than 78 Kelvin. That is why this can be applicable, or 300 Kelvin. But in the moment, if you do the same experiment at 10,000 Kelvin, this is not true anymore. I cannot apply that because then also the short range part of the interaction plays a role and then this breaks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Yeah, I, I actually have another question. Um, this is regarding your Van der Waals uh, mm -hmm. uh, molecule uh, part. And, yeah. that, and that is, see, for instance, in the, I, you know, the fact that an ion can produce in, in a cloud of atoms will produce Van der Waal molecules is something which is um, quite interesting because the way 
for instance, in the 80s, I think, there were a whole bunch of experiments with helium in supersonic beams, okay? And that was essentially would form Van der Waal clusters. And then they were taken to uh, diffraction, uh, to, to um, a wire mesh of some kind. I mean, and you were looking at diffraction and different masses would diffract to different angles and therefore you could detect what is the level of the Van der Waal molecules and clusters. So the thing is that Van der Waals molecules and clusters is actually forms in supersonic expansions. Now this is another, is this another completely different kind of a scenario yes. in which- That's Van a really good point. So indeed you're totally right, of course. So indeed, the first observation of Van Vat molecules were in, in supersonic beams, right? Yeah. But then there is uh, there has been some experiments in a buffer gas source. So basically, as you know, in a buffer gas source, you have four Kelvin, right, due to the helium. And then people thought um, three body combinations supposed to be more efficient the, the lower the energy you have, right? So then they, they thought, if I have a lot of helium, because they can, you, you know, you, you have like a lot, and then I ablate something on it. At some point, as you have three body recombination and form these Van der Waals complexes. And indeed, it has been shown for lithium helium and for titanium helium. Mm -hmm. These are compli uh, complicated systems to do for in a supersonic expansion. Because in this supersonic expansion, basically you have something like is seeded or basically the same gas. So how if so if you ablate and then you have some sub supersonic expansion, I think that's going to be hard to observe. And also the beauty of this experiment that they did in the buffer gas cell is like you have a good and easy optical access and then the spectrum is pretty clean. So they can identify the different raw vibrational states so of the complex that they form. So now the question is, is the same mechanism of formation in a buffer gas than in a beam? That's the question that we still we need to ask. And we are working on that. Because in, in a beam, what's interesting is at the very beginning, you are hot and dense, and at the end you are uh, dilute and cold. Right. So at some point, you know, there should be kind, kind of a threshold, right? Become going from one side to another. And that's the, the part we are trying now to investigate. I'm trying to see if this is going beyond uh, buffer gas cells, because of course this is only up to 20 Kelvin, and this is kind of pretty cold. Right, right. So, yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, welcome. Any other questions, please? Yeah, well, I can keep asking, but... Uh, I yeah, you, 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 please. <laughs> Just yeah. go ahead and ask. I mean, don't, don't be afraid. I think uh, we are, I think, completely out of time. Uh, yes, I, uh, but I will, I will get in yeah. touch with you later. Sure, and, sure. Uh, put put some questions to you, yeah? Yeah, of okay. course, of course. So I think we have to call the session to a close because uh, we'll have a, another session following quickly. And I thank all three speakers uh, in this particular, actually four speakers. Uh, Matthias Weidemuller was also there and I adiabatically continued as the chairperson. Uh, but I would like to thank all the four speakers. It was an excellent set of talks and um, I wish you all a very happy weekend. And uh, yeah, let's continue with some other talks in the evening. Yeah. Thank you guys. Yeah, bye-bye. Okay.